Do you have an available to you? Huh? Do you have an available to you? Not right now. Yeah, we do. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. You do need it. So what? If I take away the blood supply to the bone, how long do I see irreversible cell death in the bone? Uh, no, not that. That's uh, not Why would it make sense? Oh dear Lord. I mean, that's why we need it. Any tissue in your body that loses blood supply dies. So how long until it dies, until we see irreversible death? Six hours. Does anybody remember that? I no. Remember, I, I remembered that about the organ. I thought it had the same yeah. thing to do with the tissue. I thought it was only going to be a heart. No. Yeah. It's any living tissue. Oh, right. Except for your brain. How long until we see irreversible cell death in the brain? Okay. That's 20 minutes. minutes. 20 minutes. So you said this, this is for any organs? Organ? Said Any tissue in the body in six hours. You take away blood supply, you see irreversible cell death in six hours. You have to include irreversible in that definition. Irreversible cell death occurs in six hours. Any tissue in the body, you take away the blood supply, except the brain. In the brain, you see irreversible cell death in 20 minutes. Okay. 
Is that the same books? I mean, it don't have to somewhere like that? It's a college? Yeah. Okay. The adult human has, we're going to go with 206 bones in the body. That's the number that we all agree upon. Um, the child has, the newborn has like 300 bones. And the reason for that is because the bones start out more like cartilage. Closer to 300. This is sort of a simplification, but if you're wondering how do you get less bones, it's not that they disappear. But again, this is a simplification. But if you look at this, this way, we have one bone here, we have one bone here, we have one bone here. That would be three bones. In between is cartilaginous tissue. Um, the reason for this is, and again, please understand, this is just a representation. But the idea behind this is that uh, those bones are going to be very, very flexible when that baby's first born, which is good because nobody wants to give birth to a baby that has solid, rigid bones. That would make things much more difficult. But the bones are still made up of uh, a great deal of cartilage or cartilage of tissue. And then they go through a process we call ossification, where that cartilage-like tissue turns into bone. So rather than having three separate bones, now we end up with just one. <coughs> so that's how an example of how you can go from having more bones to less. That's why that newborn would have closer to 300, whereas the adult human has 206. Remember, more than half of those bones are found in hands and feet. We did the math on that. Uh, you'll notice I have here about 10% of the skeleton broken down or repaired each year. I understand uh, that's just an average. The reason the skeleton gets broken down or repaired is because the tissue becomes old and it needs replaced. It's just like when they pave roads outside. After a while, after so many years, they have to tear it up and put down the new surface. So you can kind of think of the same time, the same thing happening here. But of course, if it's a brand new road, they're not just going to tear it up next year and then redo it again. Let's tear it up next year, redo it again. <coughs> they're going to tear up the older ones and replace those. So our bones go through this process, but obviously, in our younger years, we don't have a lot of bone getting bro broken down because it's still brand new bone or close to brand new bone. So when you see that number, it's just an average, about 10% of the skeleton. Uh, so you'll hear people say over a, over a course of seven years, you get a brand new skeleton. Well, not really. Uh, that's not like from zero to seven, you get a brand new one. From uh, eight to 14, you get a brand new one. It's not quite like that. Um, but if you consider the average over the course of a lifetime, um, how many times the skeleton, the cells get broken down or replaced, that's where they get that number. They have a way of describing the skeleton in two separate components. The part straight down the middle is called the axial skeleton, and then every bone that comes off of that is called the appendicular skeleton. Not terribly important to know, to realize, but you'll hear um, them sort of, I don't know, differentiate between the two. So I just wanted to include that terminology. We talked about the skull before, yes. We talked about the sutures. <coughs> We're not going to talk too much about this. If you look on page 27 of the notes, that you now have in front of you, you're going to see my terms. So here's the game plan. If I've listed if I've listed the names here in the notes, then you need to be able to identify them. So as we're going through this, if you see that I've listed the names, that means they're necessary for you to know. In other words, to be able to identify them. So starting with the head, 
the skull here. The first bone right in front. This bone here is called the frontal bone because it is in front. front. And it is bordered posteriorly by that coronal suture that runs this way. We have these two big green bones here, while well, they're green in the skin. And they are a mirror image on either side. They're separated by the sagittal suture. You can't really see, it sort of blends in. But these are actually two separate bones, and these are called the parietal bones. Parietal bones. Parietal bones. If you look towards the back, there's this bone here called the occipital bone. And the occipital bone, you can see, makes up some of the portion of the rear of the cranium. But it also makes up a huge portion of the underside of the base of the cranium, mm. all that in brown. And the occipital bone is where we find this right here, which is called what? The foramen magnum. The foramen magnum. Foramen magnum, which means what? Big hole. Oh, big hole. Big hole. So the foramen magnum is right here in the occipital bone. On the sides, we have the temporal bone here, and it's important to note the temporal bone continues all the way up to this part here, towards the cheek. And I say that because if you look at Ben, there's a separation right here. And it looks like that would be a, like a suture, but it's actually just a separation because he's a model. And when he was created, they didn't create that as one part. <coughs> But that temporal bone extends all the way right here to the cheek. And you can see with the temporal bone, there is a hole right here, like an indentation where the bones in the middle here are going to sit. And then there's this bony projection right here, which is an important landmark. That's that bony projection that you feel right behind your ear. That is the mastoid process. That is still part of the temporal bone. And then going medially and somewhat anterior is the styloid process. This pointy little projection here. That's the styloid process. Mastoid process, styloid process. Mm -hmm. Now understand, because we're human, there's going to be variation. So if you look at bent styloid process, it's just a tiny little number right here. But on this one, it's much longer and pointier. Could you show that again? <clears throat> That's the styloid? styloid process. Still part of the temporal. That's why I like this skull for demonstration because everything's color coded so you can see the different parts. Mastoid and styloid. Mastoid and styloid. Part of the temporal bone. Yes. If you look here, the red, this is the sphenoid bone. Now, the sphenoid bone looks like a little rectangular piece of bone, but what you need to understand, if you look this way, it actually goes completely across to the other side. It is kind of a butterfly shaped or horse saddle shaped bone that makes up part of the front of the cranium. In red here, this is the sphenoid bone. So it looks like a little rectangle here, but the reality is it stretches all the way across to this side. What's that? Sphenoid. 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 Yes, like an SF sound. Sphenoid. Now, part of the sphenoid bone that you can see deep inside here is the ethmoid bone. Now, even though I've listed ethmoid bone in these pages, this is one of the ones you don't need to identify. The reason for that is because it's just kind of deep inside, and you would have to be easier to take the sphenoid bone out and show it to you that way. Um, so I want you to hear about the ethmoid bone, but you don't have to identify that one. How do you spell it? E-T-H, ethmoid. It's at the top of the page. Very last thing in that sentence, I think. Very last word of the sentence. Ethmoid. The top first sentence. And it's one of the last one. Read the first yeah. sentence. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're saying we don't need to know where, where it is. You don't need to know about the ethmoid. That one you do not need to identify. Uh, we're not going to worry about the nasal bones, these little bones right here, the purple ones. We're not going to worry about the lacrimal bones, the ones that are in here, they're kind of small. We're not going to worry about the vomer. 
which is this plow-shaped zone right in here. Uh, but we're going to worry about this one right here in blue. And that is the zygomatic bone. Zygomatic bone. Zygomatic bone. And it is a Z bone, meaning it begins with the letter Z. And the problem with that is when you go to memorize all these, you're going to memorize this is the Z bone. Well, I will tell you that on your word bank that you're going to get, there's going to be other Z words there. So you can't just memorize it as, oh, that's the one that begins with a Z, because I know you're going to memorize it as that's the one that begins with a Z. So you actually have to know it has zygomatic. Zygomatic. The yellow is the maxilla. The maxilla holds the upper teeth, makes up part of that hard palate. And then the only movable bone in the skull is the mandible, the lower jaw bone. Mandible. mandible. What one you were just saying that holds the teeth? Maxilla. Maxilla holds the upper teeth. Maxilla? Maxilla. And then mandible is the jaw bone. Maxilla. Maxilla. Mandible. So we have the frontal bone, the two parietal bones. We have the occipital bone with the frame and magnum. We have the temporal bone with the mastoid process, the styloid process. We have the sphenoid bone, which goes all the way across. We have the zygomatic bone, which makes up the cheek right here. We have the maxilla, holds the upper teeth, and we have the only movable bone in the skull is the mandible. Occipital? Occipital. 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 Now, if you look here, there's one more bone that's on that list on that page, and it is right here. This right here is the hyoid bone. And the hyoid bone is unique because it is the only bone in the body that does not articulate with another bone. Is that like a male's Adam's up? No, it's actually above that. This is an attachment site for the tongue. The hyoid bone is the only bone in the body that does not meet up with another bone. It doesn't articulate with another bone. So the only reason it's sitting right here is because it has to attach to something. Otherwise, it would be floating out in space. It helps to give some support to the larynx, too. So in our body, it doesn't connect to another bone, correct. but probably muscles and joints? Correct. Ligaments. Mm. The Adam's apple is, the Lord, is here. Look. Take this, this right here is the hyoid bone. This light blue is the laryngeal cartilage with the laryngeal prominence. The laryngeal prominence right here is the uh, what people call the Adam's apple. God. Everybody has this. It's just different that in men, it's more, prominent. it's more obvious. In women, it's less obvious. But everybody has a laryngeal prominence. <clears throat> Frame and magnum, the hole in the occipital bone through which the spinal cord passes through the brain. Well, all meets up brain stem beneath the brain. And remember, frame is a hole. On the next page. So, what I've done in this case is I've taken out a vertebra. I've taken out one of the thoracic vertebrae and I stood it up this way and drew it like this. So that's how you see it there. So the spinous process, this part right here, on the paper is actually the part sticking out the back here. So the spinous process would actually be like this. It means the transverse processes that are here and here sticking out like this would actually be more transversely like this. The vertebral foramen where the spinal cord goes right here of course would be more like this. And the body of the vertebra this part here actually sits like this. 
So when we talk about the vertebrae, we have to name these. However, it's fairly simple. We just divide the three sections. The cervical region, the thoracic region, and the lumbar region. And I'll get this later. Okay. The cervical region right here has seven uh, cervical vertebrae. So all we do is we number them one through seven. So the first one is C1, so cervical vertebra number one, cervical vertebra number two, cervical vertebra number three, cervical vertebra number four, cervical vertebra number five, cervical vertebra number six, cervical vertebra number seven. Or we just call them C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. Now we'll see that uh, actually C1 and C2 have alternative names. Uh, C1 is sometimes called the atlas because the world sits upon it. And C2 is called the axis, as there's a wooden, or wooden mm, a bony little projection that sticks up this way. And then the first cervical vertebra sits on top of it and is able to spin like this. You can't see it here, you'd have to take them apart. But there's a little bony projection that sticks up from C2 that allows C1 to spin around, which is why C2 is called the axis. So C, you said, so C, C1 assists C2? No, actually just the opposite. C2 is there with the post. C1 spins around the post. Oh, okay, okay. Helps me to do this. Okay. <coughs> There's a, a fracture right here it's called a hangman's fracture. Uh, I've got the name, not surprisingly, because when people are hung from the neck, often this breaks right here. This part of C2. Although uh, you'll you'll hear about hangman's fracture still today a lot, not because people are getting hung a lot, but as a result of sudden deceleration injuries, where they're in a car, hits a wall, their head snaps forward and snaps back, or they're in a car and somebody hits them really hard from behind, their head snaps back and snaps forward. You would call it a whiplash injury. Um, but one of the potential things is it could break this part of C2 right here. And that's concerning because what is this protecting? It's a spinal cord. Spinal cord, <clears throat> yeah. So we don't want to damage that. So we have seven cervical vertebrae right here. And how many cervical vertebrae does a giraffe have? I don't know. Seven. <laughs> Still seven. They're just bigger. Oh. Because cervical? cervical means neck. Before you start thinking, I thought cervix has something to do with the uterus. Yeah, it does. The cervix is the neck of the uterus. So these next vertebrae right here, the thoracic vertebrae, oh, there are 12 of them. They are unique because each thoracic vertebra has a pair of ribs coming off the other side. Which means if there's 12 thoracic vertebrae, there's got to be 12 pairs of ribs. And there are. You said they can make? What'd you say? I said there's a pair of ribs coming off of each side. So if there's 12 thoracic vertebrae, there's 12 ribs, 12 pairs of ribs. And again, we just call them. T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And that takes us down to the lumbar region. And there are five lumbar vertebrae. And we just call them L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Obviously, they're the biggest because they have to hold a lot of all the weight from above which means all the way to the upper body really comes down and sits right here at this joint where L4 meets L5 or L5 meets the sacrum. That's a lot to have to hold up right there. Speaking of the sacrum. So the sacrum? Sacrum. What's that? This part right here. It is one third of the pelvis. The 
the safe from right here. And it actually has five vertebrae that are fused together like this. It has five vertebrae that are fused together like this. So we still count them separately. S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. It's five vertebrae that are fused together like this. That is the sacrum. Five vertebrae fused together like this. That is the sacrum. How do you spell sacrum? S-A-C-R-U-M. Oh, I see it. I see it. I five see it. vertebrae fused together. And at the end of the sacrum, we have the tailbone called the coccyx. C-O-C-C-Y-X. Typically of four vertebrae fused together, but you don't need to know that. You can just call that tailbone the coccyx. The coccyx is the tailbone. Tailbone is the coccyx. Coccyx is the tailbone. Got it. Yes? So for the, well, for the, all the other ones, you kind of like abbreviate it as like neck. Think of it as the neck. Think of it as the ribs and the 12 ribs. <coughs> and for the lumbar, how will we, like as far as, do we think of it as like the area uh, between the hip and the, and the ribs. Okay. So. And there are five vertebrae there, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. So here's how it's going to show up in the test. It's going to be the form of a multiple choice exam, not a question. Um, you're going to have to know how many cervical vertebrae there are. You're going to have to know how many thoracic vertebrae there are. How many lumbar vertebrae there are. How many are in the safe room. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up the numbers and I'm going to mix up the order. So that what that means is if all you do is try and memorize, which is exactly what you're going to do, if all you do is try and memorize that there's seven here, 12 here, five here, and the sacrum is five fused together, you're going to get the question wrong. Because I'm going to put them in different order, I'm going to mix up the order, I'm going to mix up the numbers. What that means is you have to know there's 12 thoracic, there's five in the sacrum fused together, there's seven cervical, there's five lumbar. You have to know them in every order. There's 12 thoracic, seven cervical, the sacrum is five fused together, and there's five lumbar. Sacrum is five fused together, there's five in the lumbar, there's seven cervical, there's twelve thoracic. You have to know them in, uh, not just in this order. What they, a lot of times they'll try and teach students, uh, the way to remember this is you have breakfast at seven, you have lunch at twelve, you have dinner at five. Hmm. Well, I skip breakfast, I won't have lunch until 2.30, and dinner's going to come probably about 9.15. So that doesn't work for me. You can't memorize it like that. Seven cervical, twelve thoracic, five lumbar, five in the sacrum fused together. Got it? Five in the sacrum fused together. Five in the sacrum, sacrum fused together. together. Five in the sacrum fused, fused together. together. And I do it like that because that's the shape that it takes. Like this. Doctor. Got it? Got it. Cervical, seven. Thoracic, 12. Lumbar, five. 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 Well, um, will they specialize on C2 and C1 as far as what are they? The C2? No. Okay. Just something we should have. Good way to remember this. Uh, if you think of the neck region. What's this region called? <coughs> the surgeon. No, don't say it like that. Say it like this. Listen, listen, say it like this. S cervical. S cervical. And how many vertebrae are there? Seven. seven. No, there's seven. Seven. So if you remember, there's seven cervical. If you remember like that, you'll know it forever. Got it? Seven cervical. 
How many thoracic are there? Twelve. 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 If you spell the word twelve, how do you spell the word twelve? T. With a T. How many? Uh, the thoracic, of course, begins with a T. T. So there's twelve with a T, thoracic with a T. There's twelve with a T, thoracic with a T. There's twelve with a T, thoracic with a T. So if I ask you how many uh, cervical vertebrae you are, you'd say there's seven, seven cervical. Seven. That's your answer. There's seven cervical. If I ask you how many thoracic vertebrae there are, you'd say there's twelve with a T, thoracic with a T. Twelve with a T. Twelve with a T, thoracic with a T. Twelve with a T, thoracic with a T. And then how many lumbar are there? Five. Five. <laughs> you got nothing but it. You're on your own. Lumbar, there's five. And of course, the sacrum is five. Fuse together. Fuse together. together like this. Sacrum is five. Fuse together. Fuse together. Fuse together. <coughs> that shape. The sacrum is five. Fuse, fuse together. together. Sacrum is five. Fuse together. Sacrum. It's five. Fuse together. Got it? Got it now. Again, I will not put a vertebra on the test. I will not do this and put this on the table and say, which one is it? Because I don't know which one it is. I know it's a lumbar vertebra because I can tell from the size. I can tell there's not an area for the ribs to attach. So I know it's a lumbar vertebra. But without having the other ones in place, it would be really difficult to know uh, exactly which one it was. Is there, so when you say a place for the ribs to attach, are you talking about a hole on those ones? Yeah, there or? would be an indentation where the ribs could okay. in. I wish I had a thoracic vertebra with it. I have some at home, but I think they're all in a collection of so I can't take them out like, like attached. Oh, where are we? Scapula. The scapula is a shoulder blade. And you can see what they call a blade. Like a scalpel. It's not a scalpula, it's a scapula. But you can see why it's called a blade. And here's what I did in this case I took a right scapula, like this one right here, and I took it off and I drew it like this. So you're seeing the anterior surface of the scapula. And there are important things about this you need to know. I know you're thinking, well, why do we have to know all these little nooks and crannies and projections and things? There are things about this you need to know. For instance, the acromion is right here. This is the acromion. It's actually called the acromion process, but I just call it the acromion just to make it a little easier for you. So this is the acromion. And the reason this is important for you medical assistants is because you're going to use this to find your landmarks to get injections. So the top border of your injection site, the deltoid muscle, is actually found by first finding the acromion. And it's just a couple of centimeters below that creates the top border of your injection site. So this is a landmark, the acromion. It's also, of course, you can see the attachment to the clavicle here. Um, this right here looks like a little bent finger. <coughs> That's the coracoid process. See, it looks like a bent finger right here. Coracoid process. Coracoid. Yes. Process. Process. This is an important attachment site for the bicep muscle and for the pectoralis muscle. So it looks like a little bent finger. It's a part of the scapula. The coracoid process. So this is the acromion process, but I just call it the acromion. It makes it easier so you guys don't mix it up. The acromion, the coracoid process. Then right here, if I turn it this way, there's an indented area called the glenoid fossa. And the glenoid fossa is the area where the upper arm bone rotates. It's the socket to the ball and socket joint. It's kind of subtle, but you can see it right here as this indentation, the glenoid fossa. So scapula with the um, the chromium, coracoid process, and the glenoid fossa. Yes? Um, in between the chromium and the um, coracoid, is that where the scapula or the, the um, clavicle sits? It actually like, attaches kind of right, like here. right here on the chromium. 
I was on top of the crew. Right after you crew. Gotcha. It's like this. Yeah. It doesn't go in between. It's like locking like this. But that's where you're thinking you know. yeah. It actually attaches right here. Gotcha. You have to know the The chrome is going for the process and blood on the process. How do you spell blood on the process? It's at the top of page 29. Oh, I see. I see. It is not bold. It's just not listed on there. Because I can because in order to see it, you have to turn the scapula this way. Okay. So what you're getting in the drawing is this. So you're not really seeing it right here, but when I turn this way, you can see it a little bit. It's like right here though. Yes. So literally it's the socket. Yes. The socket to the ball and socket joint. The collarbone or the clavicle. It takes about six pounds of pressure to break this. This is a bone that is often broken during childbirth, not moms, the babies. Sometimes intentionally broken because if a shoulder gets stuck, the doctor can try and break this, and then that's going to allow the shoulder to sort of roll forward a little bit, which is going to create a smaller shoulder, shoulder diameter. It's going to be able to manipulate that shoulder out. However, it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, you figure you're already working in a tight space and everything's really slippery and you're just trying to use your fingers. Uh, the reality is this often breaks um, just incidentally, just as a process of childbirth. So more commonly when there's a broken clavicle on a baby, it's just because the uterus was pushing and the baby wasn't fully it was broken. But it heals pretty well spontaneously. Oh, it's still like a really traumatic part. About six pounds of pressure to break. Not a lot. And here's what you need to know about that clavicle. It is the only true S-shaped bone in the body. The clavicle is the only true S-shaped bone in the body. I definitely didn't know that. It's called a clavicle. It's the only true S-shaped bone in the body. Now, some people will say um, in the bones in the middle here, if you look at the malleus and the incus, it's sort of they're sort of S-shaped too. There's very small bones, especially the malleus, but it actually looks more like a question mark. So to me, it's like a half of an S. The clavicles are actual full S-shaped. Only true S-shaped bone in the body. Yes. Is it S-shaped because, as on? Uh, ben here, it looks pretty straight. So is it S-shaped on the top view or? From, from the top view. From the top? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're seeing it from. So straight on, view. it looks straight. Yeah, but on the top, course. you're straight looking down, it's going to be an S. Can you tilt it forward? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to tilt Ben forward, no. I'm not going to dip wow. Ben. No. Because <laughs> we're not doing the tango. Maybe we are. No. What I will show you though is I'll show up up on the screen in a few minutes. What it looks like all by itself. Uh, what else do I want to say about the clavicle? The only true of shape bone. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, I should ask you. Okay, that takes us to the bones of the sternum. There's actually three bones there. Most people call that oops, call that the breastbone, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, is the answer. Uh, or in medicine, you'll hear people call it the sternum. Those of us one. There's actually three parts to it. The top part is called the manubrium. This part, very most simply, is called the body of the sternum. Oops. And then this bottom part is called the xiphoid process. It's both the X. Sounds like a Z. Xiphoid process. After this class, you can just go ahead and back to calling this whole thing the sternum. That's fine. I just want you aware 
So it's actually made up of three separate parts. Um, these are these are important. There's important landmarks here, especially here, here, and here. Uh, that will that in emergency medicine uh, you would see more so than what you guys did. But um, I still kind of want to make sure everybody's aware that these are these parts exist. Again, after this class, you can just call this whole thing the sternum, that's fine. Sternum. Yeah. Is that all centered for a reason too? Like how the heart is left centered? Like the sternum not being exactly. It should be more in the center. I thought it was like, I thought it was meant to be like that. Yeah. It's still more in the center. Interesting. And then this, of course, is cartilage. It represents the cartilage here, that translucent material. And then we have these ribs. Now, uh, remember I said the ribs actually start in the back. Coming off of each of those thoracic vertebrae, they actually swoop downwards. As we breathe in and out, you see their movement like a handle of a button. Uh, the way we name ribs is pretty simple. Right side, left side. Remember, it's always the patient's right or left. Right side, left side. And then we just number them. One side, seven, eight, seven, twelve. One, eight, 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 twelve. Um, I will tell you, however, there's a little bit of a difference in some of these. Some of the difference is obvious. You can see it right here. But if you look at the first uh, seven pairs of ribs, one, five, six, seven, something you'll notice about them is they are a rib that's connected to cartilage that's connected to bone. Bone to cartilage to bone, bone to cartilage to bone. And that's a little bit different with rib pairs 8, 9, and 10. Rib pairs 8, 9, and 10 are bone to cartilage that goes to cartilage. So rib pairs 1 through 7 we call true ribs because it goes bone, cartilage to bone, bone, cartilage to bone. Rib pairs 8, 9, and 10 we call false ribs because they go bone, cartilage to cartilage. And rib pairs 11 and 12 are also false ribs. So there's five uh, false ribs, five pairs of false ribs. And the 11 and 12 are also called the floaters, and you can see why. They just float, they all float down here. <laughs> Maybe you don't get it. <laughs> Some people. I get it. It's so, I know, it's so sad. It's funny. You see the bottom page 29, the area of the cartilage meets the ribs. So it's the costochondral joint. But you could have figured that out, could you, Joe? Yep. Yep. And that takes us to a break. So let's take a break. Did everyone sign in? If you did not sign in, the next bones are the bones of the arm, the lower arm, the radius, and the ulna. Now, the radius is this one here. It is on the lateral side. In other words, it is on the thumb side. The radius is on the bum side, the lateral side. The radius, if you look at it, is smaller at the proximal and it gets larger down here, the distal end. Smaller up here, but it's larger at the distal end. And you also see there's a bump right here, this very obvious bump. This is where the bicep muscle comes down and attaches, right here. So that when the bicep muscle contracts, it pulls the arm this way. Oh. Well, it's pulls the arm from here to here. Now there's something really unique about the radius. At the very proximal end, there's a cup. Like this. And as it comes down, right down there. But there's a cup at the top, at the proximal end. The reason for that is because of this right here. Watch this. 
this is what happens. The radius is not only on the thumb side, but the radius follows the thumb. So when you flip your hand this way, your radius actually crosses over the ulna, crosses over the other bone. And the reason that happens is because of that cup right up here. If it didn't have this cup, it wouldn't be able to swivel like that. <clears throat> so it has to be able to swivel. And that's what that cup does at the top, at the proximal. Quite unique. Is it the joints and stuff that stop the other bones from making that movement, even though they quote unquote can't? It's the type of joints. Okay. It's, a, it's the shape of the joints. Gotcha. If so you look the at, ball and socket. Yeah. Shape. If you look at the ulna, the next one here, this is on the pinky side. And the ulna, a couple of things you'll notice. Obviously, it's on the pinky side. It's larger at the proximal end and smaller at the distal end, which is exactly the opposite of the radius. And that makes sense if you've ever tried to put shoes in a shoebox. You have to flip them. So these are flipped, whereas this one's smaller at the proximal and larger at the distal. This one's larger at the proximal and smaller at the distal. End. Then this one has a really unique shape. The ulna has a really unique shape right up here. The ulna has a ulna. Ulna has a very obvious C-shaped cutout to it. Oh. Mm -hmm. These are these are caricatures, of course, but it has a C-shaped cutout. You cannot see it here because it's lost in oh. the joint, but that's what allows this to hinge this way. He shows it on his, on his bone yeah, video. Yeah, I showed it on the bone video a lot. It's the uh, only bone in the body where you're going to find this very obvious C-shaped cutout. So as soon as you see a bone with that C-shaped cutout, you know it's got to be the ulna. Oh. And then right here, you see this bony projection. It's the alacronon, sorry, alacronon. It's spelled O-E-L-C-R-A-N-O-N. Alacronon, O-E-L-C-A-R-A-N-O-N. <coughs> and that is that bony part that you feel right here is your elbow. That's actually. Oh, that no, <coughs> that's the skin. Oh, the skin of it. Yeah, this is actually the bony projection. Mm -hmm. That's the elbow. That's the elbow. Oh, okay. So those bones come down and meet the carpal bones in the hand here. These little irregularly shaped bones, and there are eight carpal bones in the hand. The wrist. Eight, eight of these carpal bones. Eight carpal bones. Is that like just like just this part? Yep. Right here. And the reason for those bones, all those regular bones, so that we can make these different hand movements. So in the joint, right here. I didn't identify them. I didn't separate them. No. Okay, but that's in this way that located was the basic. Yes. Yeah. So this is the carpal bone. Those are the carpal bones. And there are eight carpal bones. There are eight. I'll give you a handout later on that actually shows them individually. Okay. Uh, right, really individually, but you don't need to know the names. I'm sorry. I said I ain't got to trace my hand. You do not. <laughs> Extending from the eight carpal bones, there are these long bones here in the hand. These five bones are called the metacarpal bones. They extend up and make up the knuckle. Those are the metacarpal bones. The way to know or to remember these is you could ask them. You could ask these bones, hey, have you bent the carpal bones? And they'll say, yes, we're metacarpals. Metacarpals. <laughs> metacarpals. They met the carpal bones right here. Carpal metacarpals. Then from the metacarpal bones extends the digits. Each of these digits here has three parts, you can see. Each part has a bone. Here, we call them the phalanges, or singular, it's phalanx. And we just call it the proximal, middle, or intermediate, and distal phalanx. And that's true in every one of our fingers except for our thumb that only has two. You said proximal, middle, proximal, and a distal. So each finger has three bones, 
a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, or an intermediate you might see it that way, and a distal phalanx. And that's simply how they're described. What that means is, if you look at my hand, this is my right hand, you can see the patient's right hand. Digit number one, digit number two, digit number three, digit number four, digit number five. Why not? Why not? There's just so many. Okay. Yes. Probably the same like blepharoplasty. I just saw a video of blepharoplasty. Yeah. So it goes with the same with the metacarpal, by the way. Metacarpal number one, metacarpal number two, metacarpal number three, metacarpal number four, metacarpal number five. Very simple. Okay, moving on to the pelvis. Remember, the pelvis is made up of three main parts. The pelvis is made up of two anomalous bones. This is an anomaly. There's one on the other side, a mirror image. This is an anomaly. There's one on the other side, and the sacrum in the middle. Looking at the pelvis, there are parts of the pelvis that we need to know. You know why up here? The flat bone of the pelvis here is called the ilium. Spelled I L I U M. The flat bone of the pelvis is called the ilium. Spelled I L I U M. This right here is the ilium. Spelled I L I U M. And I say that it is the ilium spelled I L I U M because there's another ilium in our body. And that is part of our small intestines, the longest part, in fact, of our small intestines. Mm -hmm. Called the ileum, spelled I L E U M. L E. That's an I L E U M. It's the largest, longest part of our small intestines. So, this is the bone, I L I U M. You know I'm going to try to mix you up on this, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to intentionally try to mix you up. L L I U M. No, I L I L I U M. I hate when they do the L L I's and L. I L I U M, ilium. I L E U M. In the small intestines. Small intestines, ilium. E. Yes. Small intestines. This right here is the iliac crest. You can feel that. The anterior superior iliac crest is the part that you would feel highest and furthest to the front. As your hip bone, you can feel highest and furthest to the front. That's the anterior superior iliac crest right here. This bone right here is the pubis. The pubis. And there's cartilage that sits right in between. You can see it on Ben a little bit better. Right here. That is the pubic symphysis. The symphysis pubis. Like a little space? Pubic symphysis. It's not a space. It's cartilage. Look right here. It's cartilage. Oh, okay. And that's so that there's some movement here, which is especially important when she's giving birth. As you can imagine, a little extra movement here, considering the baby is coming through here. So this is the pubis. The cartilage in between is the pubic symphysis. Is it uncommon for something to break in the mom during? Yeah. Yeah. There could be a separation there. Hmm. I think we actually talk about that later on. So you said the pubic symphysis is the cartilage. Cartilage. The pubis <laughs> is the bone. This bone right here is the ischium. 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 Now, ischium. Now, if you look at Ben. The pelvis is actually tilted this way, mm -hmm. which means the ischium is actually more yeah. towards the back. Okay. Yes, it's more about what you're sitting on right now. The ischium. I was going to ask, is that considered the butt bone? It's, it's a butt bone. Because okay. people call it tailbone a butt bone. Okay. The ischium. And if you look here, 
there's a projection called the ischial spine, or the spine of the ischium. Mm -hmm. Ischial spine, on either side. And that's the, okay. It's right next to the ischium. Okay. Ischial spine. This is a landmark that we use uh, when she's in labor and delivery to determine if her pelvis is straight like this, or if her pelvis is diverging like this, or if her pelvis is converging like this. Straight pelvis, diverging pelvis is good. Okay. Converging pelvis yeah. could create an outlet obstruction. So we use these as landmarks to try to determine that. Ischial spine. And then this right here is the socket to the ball and socket joint. This is called the acetabulum, spelled A-C-E, tabulum. Acetabulum, spelled A-C-E, tabulum. Acetabulum. Not acetabulum, it's tabulum. A-C-E, tabulum, acetabulum. That's the sockets to the ball and socket joint where that large leg bone is going to rotate. Which takes us to the large leg bone. Biggest, longest, strongest bone in the body is the femur. It has that very obvious ball, the ball and socket joint with a very long neck. Longest, strongest bone in the body is the femur. Patella. 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 Kneecap. I'm the same kneecap. Patella. Kneecap. I just want it. T A T E R. Patella. Kneecap. Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with popliteal, which means what? Back of the knee. Back of the knee. Back of the knee. Back of the knee. So, patella. Patella is the kneecap. I don't know if you want to put this on the is test that, or not. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be fun to just throw a patella on there. Because it would look like a stone. Alright. Now, a similarity I want you to notice here. Please look up here, not down. Look up here. We have a ball and socket joint in the arm, right? Yes? Yes. So we have one big long upper arm bone. Yes? Yes. Yes. That comes down to be two side by side long bones. Yes? Yes. If we look at the leg, we have a leg with a ball and socket joint with one long bone, which then comes down to meet two side by side long bones. And notice the difference here. There's a gap. There's a space here. That's a lot different than here, especially with the ulna. There's no gap that wraps right around it. The reason for that is because we have a whole lot of cartilage in here. We have extra cartilage padding because we have to. All the weight of our upper body comes down to this point right here. So we have to have that extra cushioning in there. So, we have bone that comes down and meets a whole lot of cartilage before it meets that next bone. And if you look at these two side-by-side -side long bones, the big obvious one in the front is the tibia. Look here, don't look down there yet. The big obvious one in the front is the tibia. The one that's more lateral is the fibula. They do not rhyme. It is not tibia, fibula, and tibula, fibula. It is tibia, Fibula. Fib. Tibia, fibula. Now let's look at each of those bones individually for a moment. One thing you'll notice about the tibia, which begins with what letter? A T. A T. So let's begin with a T. The tibia begins with a T. So if you look at the tibia, it sort of comes down like this. I'm exaggerating a little bit. It's a little narrower, but. 
If you look at the top of the tibia, it sort of looks like a T. A T. You see it here? Yes? Mm -hmm. Straight across this way and down. And look at the bottom here, there's a notch. You see it right here? Mm -hmm. I've exaggerated a little bit on this on the bone again. Again, it's just a caricature of the bone, but you can see that notch right there. And then you'll notice, if you look at the fibula, the fibula does not come up and meet. Orange. The fibula does not come up and meet the femur. The fibula actually comes up and meets the tibia. So it's sort of like here. And then as a sort of spear point off to the end. It comes up and meets the top of the tibia. You see it here? It doesn't come up and meet the femur. It meets the top of the tibia. And then you can see it kind of comes down this way and points off. The reason for that is because when you take this little notch and then that little point off there, what that does is that creates a nice little hinge for your ankle bone to be able to do this. This. They come right down and they rest upon, especially the tibia, rest right upon that ankle bone. Speaking of which, that ankle bone is a group of bones that are in the foot, just like we saw a group of irregular bones in the hand. How many were there in the hand? Eight. Eight. In the foot, there's seven. And in the foot, they're called tarsals instead of carpals. In the hand, they're carpals. In the foot, they're tarsals. And there's seven of them, and there's two that you need to know. The one that you need to know is that ankle bone right here, and that is the talus. And I believe I put the other name in there as well, the astragalus. Uh, you might see that sometimes. But talus is, is the one that I want you to know. And then there's the big heel bone. That is called the calcaneus. Calcaneus. You don't need to know the other five. You just need to know those two. The astragalus or the talus. I prefer the talus. You'll see that one more, I think. And then the calcaneus. And then you'll notice, coming from the tarsal bones here, these seven tarsal bones, there's one, two, three, four, five metatarsal bones. And that makes sense because in the hand they're called metacarpals because they're right next to the carpal bones. In the foot, they're right next to the tarsal bones, so they're metatarsals. And extending from the metatarsals are the digits. Well, you would call it toes. And each toe actually has three bones called phalanges. Proximal, middle, intermediate, and distal, just like in the hand. Except for the big toe, which only has two, a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. And you'll notice I put in here the other name for the big toe. Hallux. The hallux is another name for the big toe. The hallux. Is that a pinky toe? Pinky toe has three bones, yes. Wow, that's crazy. Look, you don't believe it. When you go home. Yeah. You, just get, like, you have to get like a scalpel or something. Like, just, like, just, uh, that's it. The frontal bone, the two parietal bones, the occipital bone with the frame and magnum, the temporal bone with the mastoid process, the styloid process, the sphenoid bone that goes all the way across, the zygomatic bone, the maxilla, and the other little bone in the skull, the cranium, the, the skull, the mandible. The hyoid bone, 
You need to know there's hyoid bone. There's seven cervical vertebrae, there's 12 thoracic, there's five lumbar, the sacrum has five that are fused together, and the tailbone is known as the coccyx. The scapula with the acromion, the coracoid process, the glenoid fossa, the clavicle, the only S shaped bone in the body. Three bones of the sternum, the nubium, the body of the sternum, and the xiphoid process, both of the necks. You need to know there's seven pairs of true ribs, one through seven. Eight, nine, and ten are false ribs, because they have a bone cartilage and cartilage. And eleven and twelve are also false ribs, but we call those floaters. You need to know the bone of the upper arms are humerus. It is not funny, but it is the humerus. And that comes down to be two side-by-side -side bones. The bone on the lateral side is the radius, which follows the thumb, because of that cup right there. And of course, the ulna is the one on the pinky side that has a very unique C-shaped part in the olacronon is the bony protection off the back. There are eight carpal bones, five metacarpal bones. Each finger has three flanges, approximal, middle, or intermediate, and distal, except for the thumb that has only two. The bones of the pelvis include the ilium, spelled I-L-I-U-M, the iliac crest, the pubis, the pubic synthesis, and the cartilage in between, the ischium back here, the spines of the ischium, the acetabulum, spelled A-C-E tabulum. The femur bone is a long bone of the leg, the thigh bone, also a ball and socket joint bone. The um, patella is the kneecap. The tibia is the large, more centrally located bone of the lower leg. And the fibula is a more laterally located, much, much thinner and longer bone. It comes down to meet seven carpal bones. The two that you need to know is the talus and the calcaneus. And there are five metatarsals from each metatarsal. There's one, two, three, approximal, middle, or intermediate, and distal flannix, except for the pallets, the big toe that has only two. <coughs> Did I forget anything? No. Got it? Got it. Everybody good? Good. Good? Good.